for our first keynote. So the White House Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy has introduced a blueprint for AI bill for an AI Bill of Rights um, aimed at guiding the design, use, and deployment of automated systems to safeguard American public rights in the era of AI. And our first keynote is really uh, about how to see this as a first step into the, into the ways we can um, make AI safer for the public and to look at this um, uh, blueprint and analyze what it means and also talk about how it was developed. Um, our keynote speaker is Professor of Data Science and Computer Science at Brown University in the US, um, and his, he focuses on the intersection of tech and policy. Please help me in welcoming Suresh Venkatasubramian. How are you, Professor? I'm fine, thank you. This is your clicker, and um, I think we'll have a clock for you there to make it easier. Can we have the clock back on our screen, please? Yes. There you go. I leave it to you. Thank you and very I much. And I encourage you to send questions. Great. Thank you all, and uh, I'm happy to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to you all here in Stockholm. It's my first time. So uh, I thought I'd start with a brief introduction to myself, mostly because I have, well, walked in many circles. I'm, I'm a computer scientist by training. and. Um, on reflection on the different paths I've taken, I realized that this theme of collaboration is very much core to the work that I'm trying to do right now. And there's a fair amount of conflict. I was in politics for a bit, so we'll talk about that as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've, uh, I'm a, I'm a I said I'm a computer scientist. I spent a lot of my time and now currently am back in academia, but I've also sort of lived in other worlds. I've spent a little bit of time Actually, not that little bit, a little bit of time in industry, uh, working in research labs. Um, but I've also worked a lot with partners in civil society. Um, I was a member of the uh, board of the um, American uh, Civil Liberties Union for a while in, in, in Utah. And I've also worked on um, a number of projects with, with government, both state and local governments, before, of course, going to the, to the White House to work on the uh, blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And so I want to set the stage a little bit for where this work came from and what the conversations, at least in the United States, are happening, which, and very similar conversations, of course, happening here in Europe um, and uh, about um, AI and its effect on society. And I think the backdrop to all of this really is the scope of issues where algorithms are now affecting people. So back when I started doing this work, you know, 10 odd years ago, we were only slowly beginning to understand the ways in which algorithms were creeping into uh, the ways in, uh, into places that actually impact people's lives. And I'm not talking about you know, your Netflix recommendations or your Amazon purchasing orders. I'm talking about places that really seriously impact you, but that you don't actually see. Like places like hiring, like medical care. We've heard about you know, precision medicine yesterday. Things like credit and loans, things like housing, criminal justice. You know, in, in fact, it would be easier for me to name places now where algorithms are not affecting you. There's such a long list now. And so as a result of that, you know, for the last many years now, and perhaps a bit sooner in, the, in Europe and maybe less so in the US, people have been concerned about how do we manage the use of these systems? How do we manage this balance between regulation and innovation that the speakers just mentioned right now? How do we allow for the potential use of AI systems in ways they might help, but making sure they don't cause more problems than they, than they, than, uh, they solve? And so that's the backdrop to where uh, we were, you know, even in 2021, where we were looking around for what, at least in the United States, was available to us in terms of policy. And so the next slide summarizes what we had in terms of policy in 2021, which is nothing. <laughs> it was a complete blank slate at the time. And so that was the situation in which I was invited to join um, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, just as a sort of point of reference for those who may not be familiar, the US doesn't really have a, a ministry of science like many countries do, but inside the sort of the, the executive office, the president, the, sort of the, inside the White House, the White House, the Office of Science and Technology Policy is, an, is a unit that's designed to provide advice to the president on uh, matters of science and tech policy, right, in various forms, whether it's, you know, it's climate change, whether it's medicine, whether it's, you know, nuclears, uh, nuclear sciences and so on. 
So that's the role I went into. And one of the first things that happened once we started working on this was, a, was an op-ed, actually, that, was, that initiated this discussion written by you know, my boss at the time, Alondra Nelson, sort of saying that we need a Bill of Rights in an AI power world. And of course, the Bill of Rights is evocative of the original Bill of Rights in the American Constitution, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that essentially laid out protections that people have against the state. Right, which was at the time a revolutionary, literally a revolutionary concept that you know, people need protections against the state in the 1700s. And similarly now, the idea of a Bill of Rights is to say people need protections against you know, a growing power, in this case, AI and technology, just to make sure that we are not you know, uh, dominated or controlled by these systems and we can use them for our own benefit. So that was the whole process of what we started with. And you know, we, we went through, a, you know, for those of you who are familiar with government, these things take a while. You go through various consultations. You get feedback from various partners, some partners across the spectrum, from industry, from civil society. We had literally had an email address where individual people could email us, and they did, with their thoughts on what we should be doing. Uh, we talked to you know, a number of stakeholders inside the US government, which you know, all different agencies have their own concerns and their own goals with using AI. And you know, in the span of a year, which seems relatively quick, I'm still watching what's happening with the AI Act. These things take time. And this is, of course, just a simple document. Within the span of a year, we were able to put out the whole document. What did we end up with? What is this blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights? What is it supposed to be about? It's a, it's a long document. It's on the White House webpage, and it you know, even has a nice mobile version. You can read it. It's, uh, you know, it's well, somewhat readable. It's uh, definitely, I wouldn't say it's written for the layperson, but it's definitely written to be read, at least to a degree. And it's got, the, the rights themselves are really just five. It's, it's actually very simple. Basically that we want systems that work and that work well, so they should not be unsafe. They should you know, not harm people, and they should do what they're promised to do. That they shouldn't discriminate, that they should be careful about the use of our data. And one thing to keep in mind is that Utah, the US does not have data protection regimes like, like, like we have here in, in, in Europe. So that also is a challenge. Um, these systems should be transparent. We should know that they're being used and they should be clear. We should understand how and why they're working. And there should be ways for us to gain recourse when the systems that are making decisions or assisting in decisions about us you know, might make decisions we don't agree with or need to appeal. There should be sort of a human process for adjudicating these things. If you ever had to interact with a chatbot and never get through to a human and felt that frustration of doing so, I think you might recognize why this is important. So these are the five principles. And they're, and they're not, I would say they are fairly natural. They hopefully feel intuitive and reasonable. And really the question is how you go about implementing them or enacting them or making them a reality. And so another thing I want to say is that, you know, even though it was called an AI Bill of Rights, the, that was almost a sort of a little bait and switch because the, really the scope of what we were talking about was all automated systems, but that have some significant impact on our civil rights, civil liberties, opportunities for advancement and access to various services. And that was by design, that we weren't just, because AI itself is a fast moving, fast changing entity, we didn't want to fix it on one thing that would just move, as we've seen with generative AI that's already happened uh, once in, in this last year. Uh, we wanted something that was broader, that any system that would impact us using technology was within scope. So, what does, you know, with this, this doc, you know, we had five rights, but we also had a, a very fleshed out sort of plan for what to do about how to make sure we can achieve these rights. And so what does it look like? So I'm not expecting you to read this wall of text, but it was just there sort of just to illustrate what it looks like. Basically, the whole idea was to articulate what is it we were concerned about and what is it you do. So if you focus on sort of the red part of that slide there, you'll see that it's really trying to define what it means for a system to discriminate algorithmically. What does that, what does that even look like? Right. And then once, that's, once you've articulated that, then the next goal is to say, what do you want from systems that you're going to put out there to protect against algorithmic discrimination? So you, have expect, you want to protect the public from discrimination, of course, and you want to make sure the system is doing so. So you have to not only do the thing, but show that you're doing the thing. And so there's a bunch of sort of ideas coming from actually a lot of academic work um, in sort of in machine learning and computer science and beyond on how to do these things and work that sort of I've been involved with as well in my past life and hopefully future life as an academic. 
So that's just an example. And then, you know, we've, there are also examples of how these things actually play into practice. You know, this document itself has no force of law. It has nothing more than inspirational power. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit about how that, you know, what's happening or what has happened in the years since the document was put out and how parts of it and hopefully all of it will eventually, you know, move into legal frameworks uh, within the U.S. as well. And, but there are other things going on there. And so that's it. And so you know, we put out the document. It was a year. Actually, it was just back in DC for the one-year anniversary celebration of the release of the blueprint. And the question is, okay, what, what's, what has happened since then? What have, what have you done since then, right? You know, and what has the world done? How has, what, what has, how has changed, things changed? So a number of things have happened. So you know, partly because of this and partly because of the rise of things like ChatGPT, Politicians across the country now are paying attention to what we should do about AI. Right, there's a lot of you know concern, a lot of fear maybe uh, about what and and so there's an attempt to sort of figure out legislation around this in the U.S. Um, the first thing that's happening is a bunch of forums that are happening in the United States Senate as a precursor to what is hopefully be legislation coming out. You know soon, we hope, um, uh, that, that we might be able to get passed on AI. And this is being, there's a whole set of forums that basically the leader of the Senate in, in, in the US is running to educate senators. These are closed door meetings, they're not open to the public, they're just for senators to attend and learn from experts in the field. So there was one, uh, there was one session that happened in uh, September and, you know, as of five days ago, it was announced that another one's happening next week, in fact, on October 24th. And the, uh, the, the scoop I can give you here is that I'll be attending that meeting and sort of talking to senators about what we should be doing about AI and innovation in particular, how to manage it, regulation and innovation. So that's one thing that's going on. There's a whole bunch of legislative proposals, you know, 60, 70 proposals in different states across the country. Um, you know, the, each state is looking at their own sort of jurisdiction and what they can do there. Um, in addition, Congress itself has got built on the docket, but they're all waiting for what happens with these inside forums. And so that's, we, we expect that something will happen soon. And that again is our ways in which we see, we hope the blueprint will sort of be um, enacted into law in some form or the other. Um, and there's a bunch of standards and guidance coming out there, you know, from different entities. There's a standards organization in the federal government called the National Institutes of Science and Technology, and they've put out a risk management framework for use with AI systems when anyone deploys them. There is guidance coming from the White House Office of Management and Budget that runs the government essentially on how agencies in the US government should be managing AI. Um, there's an executive order, which is something the president can just do and tell agencies to do without needing Congress. And that's expected to come within a couple of weeks, hopefully on this topic. And a lot of it is going to be around, you know, how we buy, procure AI systems and what expectations we have for vendors who sell them to us, how we, how the federal government gives out money to entities in the states. So the US is a very federal structure, so the federal government can't control directly what states do, but they can control indirectly through the amount of money they give to states. What kind of regulatory authorities are needed, again, to balance the need for innovation as well as, you know, um, to make sure that we put out systems that are safe and, 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 and uh, not discriminatory in some way. And also how the federal government itself uses technology as an example for what the private sector could be doing. So there's a lot of things that are going on right now that we hope to sort of see evolve over time. <coughs> In the, what, what has happened though as a result of this, so not as a result, but in the last 10 years, and this is me sort of taking off my sort of policy hat and putting back on my academic hat as a computer scientist, right? So the, 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 the discourse around AI and society has really pointed to both, in some sense, the success of computer science, the success of the digital world as, a, as an interlocutor, not just for how we work with technology itself, but how we interact with the world at large, right? So computer science and algorithms and machine learning and AI has become a language through which we speak about the world, which is a very unusual thing. It's not really something that we, that computer scientists are trained to think about or trained to do, and yet the tools we put out there are being used in places where perhaps we didn't expect them to be used. And so as a result of that, there's been a bit of a shift in how we think about what it even means to do computer science. And that's what I want to spend a few minutes talking about towards the end of my presentation here. Uh, the, what I'm calling now the, the social technical future of computing. So the history of computer science kind of in a very sort of stylized way looks like this, right? So you've had, you know, ever since the dawn of, of computing, there's been a lot of focus on 
tools that help us do things better. So you build a better hammer and it can hammer nails and better. You build a better screwdriver, you build a new kind of, a, you build a new wrench that can do new things. Tool building, that was our thing. And, and you know, when we were trained as computer scientists, that we were trained to do, to build tools, right? Or to build tools or to prove sort of theorems about tools or to design algorithms to make new tools and so on. But the very success of that tool building and the, eff the efficacy with which those tools have pervaded our world have meant that now computer science is being used to talk about people, affect our lives, predict what we do, right? We use machine learning to say, oh, we'll predict whether someone will default on a loan or whether they'll be a good employee or whether they should get this particular treatment. We are saying things about people with systems that weren't really designed to talk about people in the first place. And now this shift has been happening slowly. There are entire areas of computer science and you know, visualization and human computer interaction that have always recognized the interplay between person and machine at the core. And to some extent, you know, the very deaf word AI captures these two things, right? The artificial and the intelligent as this as core. But it's become much more important and much more pervasive right now. As a result of that, we've had to reckon with a shift in perspective in how we do the work we do in the field. And so this new sort of framework of socio-technical computing, if you haven't heard this word before, it's like a, you know, socio-technical takes society and takes te technology and sort of puts them together into what is socio-technical. And it talks, of, and the idea of thinking about socio-technical computing is to think about the intermeshing, right, of digital technologies, of people and societies, and this intermeshing that controls and shapes how we live and thrive, right? So that's the important thing. A lot of it is invisible. It shapes what we do without us quite seeing it. And it's not just take a bit of, you know, take, take a person, take a machine, put them in a thing and mix. It's much more complicated than that. What happens when we put machines into places where we're used to humans making decisions? What happens when we have human decision makers with machines assisting them and trying to make a decision about a problem? We're still trying to figure this out. We're still trying to understand what it means to truly embed technology in our lives. And so this whole area of socio-technical computing, which actually is now a sub-area of my department at Brown University, that I, that I, which I sort of help lead now, is trying to say we need to pay attention to what happens at the intersection of this. And that means many different things. It means that you know we have to think about Establishing a critical lens in design choices. What I mean by that is when we design a system, we have to critically examine the system to say, what, are the, what does it mean to design the system to work this way and not that way? What does it mean to choose this function to optimize in a machine learning system? How is that choice, that technical choice of what we optimize going to affect the people for, on whom the system is going to be used? These are not things we've ever had to think about and we're having to think about them now. Build a critical kind of muscle in our work in computer science. Um, think about design upfront, right? We talked, you know, think about upfront sort of processes rather than sort of building a system saying, oh no, the system is causing problems, let's patch on some, some like, some, some uh, cello tape and something on to make it work better. Can we design sort of from first principles to make sure we achieve the goals we want of a system when it's put out there in front of people? Making sure we center people in their interactions with technology, right? So often we design the tech first and say, you know, to use Steve Jobs' famous phrase, you're holding it wrong, right? If your iPhone doesn't work, that the problem is you and not the system. Maybe we should be reversing this, talking about what we want as, as individuals and as society and designing technology around that. What does that even mean? Again, it's not that we haven't asked these questions before, but they've become somehow central to how we think about computing in a way that I think is new. Understanding, and this is you know, the, the way in which technology can also be used as a, as a vehicle for power and for sort of amplifying power and, and suppressing those who don't have it. This is a bit more complicated, it gets more political. Again, a topic that computer science never has had to deal with before, but we're more and more facing the challenge of dealing with the politics around the use of technology. And of course, assessing the impacts of technology in a way, you know, both qualitatively and quantitatively in ways that we haven't had to do before. So all of this is new, all of this requires new thinking. It requires ways of dealing with disciplines that we're not used to talking to. And you know, I, I, it is not an exaggeration to say that in my last five, 10 years, I have worked in, you know, or at least learned from all of these disciplines, as well as computer science, right? statistics, mathematics, history, economics, law and policy, philosophy, sociology. I've written papers with some folks in these areas. I've had to sort of engage with their concerns and the way they approach the world. 
And that's just kind of the nature of the beast right now. If you're working in this area, you, you don't have to be an expert, obviously. You can't be in all these areas, but you have to be able to know enough to know what you don't know and talk to people who do. And I think that's where the collaboration comes in and where the conflict comes in as well, I think, because there's, as these panelists mentioned earlier, there's friction, there's language differences, there's attitudes, there's uh, basic epistemology that is different. And I think, um, Dealing with that is, is fun, it's exciting, it's a lot of new things to learn, but it's also a challenge and it's difficult. And that's just, I guess, how it is sometimes. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude. I want to thank you all for listening, and I'm uh, excited to hear what questions uh, you all might have for me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I just have to say that was some of the most valuable 20 minutes um, for me in a long time. You, you presented the, comp uh, the um, concept of, me uh, of intermeshing, which I will spend time exploring. And it, it, the, our first question is also about this interplay and the development process of AI when it, it, it's like a dance, it, 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 as humans and then the technology and the implications and we both, we, we um, affect the system both ways. So this first question is from a co-worker of AstraZeneca. Um, how can we regulate AI without impeding its development when we are uncertain about the required regulations and the potential impact uh, on on the development and on us humans? That's a great question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, especially in the past week or so, because next week I have to go and answer the same question for a bunch of senators on how we do innovation and regulation. I actually think it's, this question is commonly phrased, but misphrased, because it is framing innovation in opposition to regulation. And let me explain what I mean by that. You know, you all, you know, many of you well, um, uh, are, are driving on roads and, you know, we have lanes on the roads to help us, you know, go in a straight line. Um, I, I grew up in India. I don't know if you've seen how traffic works in India. It, it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, there are no lanes on the road and, you know, it's, it's a completely unregulated, let's say, area. Free for innovation and driving and there are some very innovative drivers there. But it doesn't move very fast, <laughs> as also you might know if, you're, if you ever tried driving on roads in Bangalore, where my mother lives. Uh, it moves very slowly because everyone is innovating in their own way, <laughs> and there's collisions. But we all have the same goal to get somewhere, and we want to get there as quickly as possible. So actually putting down rules of the road, literally, putting down lanes, having people stay in their lanes and follow some rules, actually makes things faster. Of course, you don't want you know, 10 lanes to make it very narrow, you want three lanes. And so the question really is not so much regulation versus innovation. It's like, what do the rules of the road need to be so that we can all drive, we all have the ability to get where we want to go, and we can do it safely? I think there is a way to do that. I think there is innovation. For example, I think of lanes themselves. You had, used to have just painted lanes. Now you have lanes with glowing sort of paint on them so you can see them at night. You have little, little markers. You have these little rum, rumble strips so that if you change lanes, it, the, the car will tell you. And with more with these self-driving cars now, they can detect the lanes and keep you in your lane. There's a lot of innovation that comes once you put in lanes. Mm. So it really thinking about how we make AI safe for people to work with is a different kind of innovation. It's just not what we're used to, and people don't like change, so it feels like we're gonna slow down. But I can assure you, we will speed up as long as we're willing to look at a different way of doing innovation. So it's iterative, it's generative. Absolutely. And, and we need a lot of different stakeholders, I hear you say, in, in this development. And um, um, there is another question here about what it means to integrate tech into our lives, and it's, could you please help us um, to, to uh, or I would be interested in your thought on the actual possibility to opt out. Uh, we, are, we are saying always that there is a, an option of opting out, and opting out of many systems and services is equivalent with opting out of society all together and how, how can this choice be re, redesigned in such a way that you not, you not just become a, a bystander? 
opting out isn't realistic. I think we're already seeing that. You know, if you opt out of you know social media, it's harder to talk to your family and friends, and that's not really an option. I think it again. For me, it comes back to design choices and what choices are presented to us. I mean, let's be realistic about this. The reason why it's so difficult to opt out and why it's so hard to do it is because companies don't want you to opt out. <laughs> they want to keep you in their system. You know, Facebook works better when more of us are on the system using it. So they want to make it hard for us to leave and they want to make it hard for us to say interoperate and have other ways of accessing it. It's not an inevitability of technology it's a design choice that's been made by entities who have the power to make those choices and who have a certain agenda. I think this is something we have to recognize because I think as computer scientists, as one myself, designing systems, I often take for granted the frame of reference saying, well, this is how Facebook is. I, I remember um, I was teaching a class on data science and ethics and um, I was talking to a student after the class and he was sort of bemoaning the fact that, oh, you know, it, there's just no, there's no way to design open systems. We're stuck with Facebook and this and that. I said, you know, you do use the web, don't you? And you use email. These are all open systems that were built. And, you know, the kid was 19 years old. He hadn't, he had, had, you know, he's, he's, I, I felt old just talking to him about that. But, but it's not as if we don't have the ability to design systems that are interoperable, that are open, that give us the power to take our data with us to do what we want. We have to call out these design choices and we have to motivate computer scientists, our students, developers to think about other ways to design. Mm. There are markets for this. People want these tools. You know, we live in a market world where you have to, everyone asks, well, how are you gonna make money off this? I'm not always saying that's the right way to ask the question, but it is a question you have to ask. There are ways you just have to build first and show people what's possible. I think people don't realize anymore what's possible with technology. They just assume what we have around us is all it's ever going to be. And I just think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And those, the, the big solutions we have around us are, many of them are super commercial. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is another one here. Um, if you, I don't know if you can answer this one, but it's about privacy again. Mm -hmm. What do you think about sharing trained models instead of raw data for privacy? This is used for training large language models, mm -hmm. so there's maybe no need to share real data um, other than surveillance. What do you think about this? And I think also if you could just explain, because this is sort of the the fundamentals of generative AI yeah. and, and just giving us an understanding of sure. what are the options here? Right, so generative AI, large language models, again, we, we use the word model to mean essentially, you know, a billion numbers <laughs> organized in some complicated way. Let's just think of it that way, right? So there's a box of numbers, that's your model. And in the question about sharing, I think, you know, like any good academic, I will answer your question with a question. <laughs> and the question is, you know, what are we sharing and for what purpose? I think we have to start with that. So one, one way that you know, the sharing issue has come up is with uh, Meta releasing one of their open source models. It's called Llama 2 because all models have to have animal names now. I don't know why. I'm, I'm waiting for the otter models because I like otters. So um, <laughs> they shared Llama 2. They shared the, the, the model numbers, the billion numbers. And then there's been some question about, you know, is this a good thing? Should we share it? Should we not share it? Issue of pri uh, privacy has come up because in there is some question about whether when training these large models to produce plausible sounding text, are they absorbing and storing within the model important personal information, right? So, you know, the Italian government was concerned about this last year and filed a case against uh, OpenAI for this reason, particularly because of GDPR violations. Um, the answer is we don't know yet. We're not quite sure to what extent these systems are memorizing personal data or using it in some form. This is again a question where the technology speed of deployment has outpaced our understanding of what, it, of what we can say about it. And that's making policy work a lot more complicated because I honestly don't know the answer to whether we're actually memorizing people's private data and whether that's an implication. There's evidence saying it might be, there's evidence saying it might not be, I don't know. But when it comes to sharing, you know, if the, if the idea is, oh, let's share models so we don't have to share personal data, I think that I, I'm not yet, again, I'm not yet sure what the, in this particular example, the purpose of sharing is, right? Is the goal to share models so you can determine what the models are doing? Then I think that's a good idea. I think what Meta did 
is a good thing to share models. I think the companies saying that we should not share models are on the wrong side of the argument. I think more openness and more sharing is a good thing. Um, but what, what we don't know, like I said, is to what extent this might compromise our personal data. And um, I think we'll have to figure that out. That's where we need more research, more evaluation of these systems to, to figure that out. Final question. How important do you think it is for normal citizens to understand a little bit more how these models work and how AI works and how the data is used? The, the way I like to think about this is, you know, I went, to, I went to the store, I got some medicine, I had a headache. So I went and got some medicine, I took the medicine, my headache went away, I was happy. I have the barest, barest understanding of how that medicine went into my body and what it did. My wife, who works in a drug company, has tried to explain these things to me, I don't understand them. I don't think I can understand them, I haven't got the training in biology to do it. But I took the medicine, it worked, and I was fine. But why did I do that? Because there was an entire infrastructure, you know, in the US there's the FDA, which sort of regulates which drugs get put out in the world. There, you know, severe testing has to be done, you know, on various groups before any drug gets put out there. I had trust that this would work, even though I didn't know myself how it would work. We don't need to understand everyone you know, need to understand how AI systems work. We don't need to at all. We shouldn't have to. We should only be, know that we can trust that the systems put out there aren't going to harm us in some way and actually will benefit us in some way. Right? The drug will actually help my headache and not cause any other problems. And we trust that, we, we want to trust that this happens because there's an infrastructure of trust regulation, you know, uh, you know, publication, transparency by companies putting out these tools that tells someone somewhere who actually knows how to read these documents that it all makes sense, that it all works correctly. So we don't need to know how, to, how these systems work, but we need to demand that there's a trust infrastructure so that we don't have to. There are so many more questions coming in. Will you be here during the first coffee break? I will. So I'm for those of you who are physically here, um, you may have uh, a coffee with a professor, Venkata Subramanian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank so you valuable. very much. It was a great